Well, uh, th thank you, Shano, and thanks, Nancy. It's so great to be with Alan again. And uh, Alan and I, we had a long, long history. But when he was like 13 year old, we, we began to work together. I think that was wonderful. And we, we, we traveled together. And so it's good to be back. And so, so thank you for, for this opportunity. You know, I just have a few things I wanna say. And thanks for all the teachers and for all the educators or whoever you are, you know, you're participating. I say that you're from Luxembourg, you're from Mexico City, some from London, some from Hong Kong. We, we truly have a global audience. Thank you so much for, for coming to a, a conversation, right? Now I want to have with Alan. So I said several things I think I want to say. First of all, um, schools are going to return to schools, you know, to maybe in next half a year, uh, in some places, maybe another year, but they are going to return. But I, I hope when we return, we will reflect on what we've been doing during COVID. You know, the remote learning, online learning, our global connections. I don't think uh, teachers would have done this without this, uh, without the COVID. But we've done amazing things. So we, we, we need to reflect. We do not need to go back and cut internet off. You know, that, that, that's really important, I think, for us to think. Number two, I think we have given students a lot more authority and permission to do online learning. You know, parents and teachers used to limit access to screen time, you know, to, to technology. Now we've given them that option. Let's not take that back. And number three, I think it's important to, for us as educators to remember, we don't have to be the only person to control a classroom. Teaching can be collaborative. Collaboration can be done globally. Collaboration can be done with other teachers. Collaboration can be done with the students. We, we need not to, uh, to do that. I think this is big transformation. I'm worried that we'll, loss, we'll lose. And the third one, I think, also shows that uh, education may be transformed if we keep with this. Education does not necessarily happen during school time and or homework time, or does not have to happen within that class. So the learning time, and the learning scope has changed. And finally, um, I think remote work is gonna transform how we prepare students. A student in Mexico City can be working for another company that's located in China, or in China, can be located in Australia. I think we're gonna have a global, truly globally networked workforce. And so that's just a few things I would like to, to chat about. And I'm sure Alan has, uh, a lot more insightful things to share with you. Not more than that. Uh, young as all, I could listen to you all day. Um, but I'm gonna pick up because of a personal story on the global workforce thing. Um, my son applied for many jobs during COVID. None of them were face-to-face -face interviews. It was all online. He got a job, which is great because I was concerned at one point that he'd be coming home living with me. So this is a personal success. Um, and he did really well. He got an, an amazingly creative job. Uh, he's a computer science guy, um, but his ability to find work, and he's never seen anybody. He's never met anybody on his team, which is very different for me. And, and maybe you too. Uh, and he now sees the world as his opportunity for work. There's no limit anymore. Okay, that's just a story. Um, and that is happening all in a couple of his friends. Now, I'm concerned that he wasn't trained to do that in school. He, he, he doesn't have any background of interviewing online. They didn't teach him that. And I, and I think if we could look beyond school, just just for those of us who have that luxury, and then figure out, okay. And, and uh, by the way, his company has announced that after COVID, it's your choice about whether you wanna go back to work physically. So he's gonna stay home and maybe go in one or two days a week. That's gonna be his, currently that's his planned life when COVID is, is gone. Now, what worries me 
is if that becomes the norm in our society, at least for a certain sector of people, that's random that they get those skills. I think schools should prepare people for the world beyond school, not just school. And I think it would be fun for schools to look out, have a small team of people who are interviewing parents and others who are connected alumni to see what can we do in school to support these fundamental changes in our society. You know, I've always, Adam, uh, go ahead, Alan. I've always found the best ideas in technology out of school anyway. And then you can say, all right, in 20 years, that will come to school. So, so that got me thinking about a conversation I had with Alan. I don't know if you remember this, maybe 15 years ago. We're talking about a growing youth. I think I was talking about how I grew up in the village, how we need to learn yeah. to make things. Uh, you know, we talk about growing digital spinach or, or digital broccoli. And, and the, the idea was really simple, is that um, we have a new world. At that time, it was transforming. And today as well, Alan's description of his song, I think it's become, it's, it is becoming the norm. And I, you know, I have a child, my son is uh, uh, doing his PhD, but in art history, he's been connecting, he's presenting, he's connecting with so many different countries. And so I think our students and uh, your students, the ones who are participating are going to enter a new world. And this world is being made right now. So I think, I, I, I think that the, this webinar, you know, whatever we're doing now is to think about how we open our mind. I mean, really, like, uh, do you have to teach that, you know, what you have to teach? So that brings another point I want to make. This is uh, after being getting so old, you know, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about, if you look at your students, we've been so focused on what they learn during a week, during a semester, and we only assess students, really. Most of the assessment is done for one semester. What did you learn in the last 18 weeks? But really, do you think that matters that much? You know, everybody will say right now, if I ask you, do you, were you so proud of your homework that you prepare it as a legacy, pass on to your family generations? Or were you so happy that you learned this, you know, during like a year three, second semester, that you feel so good, you remember that? You don't. I don't mean those are not important. They are just experiences. What I think, you know, assessment needs to be done, needs to be thought as a much longer term and much broad based. So that's another uh, thing that I just want to throw out there, but growing things digitally is to make things to solve problems. I remember that conversation a long time ago, we were going to write a book, but apparently Anna, we didn't, but we could be writing a book today. Maybe we'll have to catch up on that later. Yeah. Uh, but let's do assessment. I like, the, I like what you bring up. So Nancy and I were talking earlier, you know, on the, waiting for people to come on. I'm gonna jump to a, a guidance Nancy gave me about, about doing something that's rooted in practicality. So in many schools, assessments are run by rubrics that teachers give kids rubrics. And uh, my sense is, if you want to be practical, rubrics are almost the tail that wags the dog. That, that, that's what runs a lot, of, a lot of assessment. So I'm going to start with the tail wagging the dog. And uh, I think we ought to revisit rubrics. For example, um, I've been persuaded by people a lot smarter than me that Students asking the most interesting questions is a key skill. Not finding the answers, but really asking really creative, or re even original questions. So in the rubric, I'm gonna suggest right away that rubrics adopt uh, students asking questions component so that teachers have a sense of all the questions kids asked themselves while they were engaged in creating this paper they're writing, whatever it is. Uh, 
from questions, and this is a second addition to a rubric, is did they find the best information in the world? You know, going back to my son, for example, he researched the founder of the company. He researched all kinds of quarterly reports. He researched articles. He did more research for his interview on the web than he did for any other interview, you know, face-to-face -face interview. And he was prepared to talk about the company and its values and how it had grown and how he could contribute. He did good research. And I think that ought to be in the rubric. I think we need a rubric for good internet research. And sadly, a lot of rubrics I see, it's just vacant. There is no place for did you find the best information in the world and how did you do it? So I just yeah. throw those two things in, change of rubrics, ask questions, students ask questions, and students have to demonstrate their architecture of how they found the best information in the world. Okay, so Adam, can I um, pick on that one? Rubrics. So rubrics. it's actually interesting. In some contexts, rubrics are useless, you know, in some contexts. Because if you think yeah. about it, you know, if we want a person for the future, we need that person to come up with solutions to unknown problems. So unpredictability is really the future. And so uh, in some areas you need rubrics because you want to make sure they're mastering the content, the skills. Yeah. But really for, in the long run, if we are into the creative domain, in a creativity domain, I've been asked by many, many people say, how do you assess creativity? I said, you don't. You know, I've been working with a lot of people trying to assess creativity. And there are really thousands of creativity assessments there because I'm, I'm uh, uh, co-editing a big journal for um, for uh, American Educational Research Association uh, uh, is the review of uh, research in education, specifically on democratizing creativity and entrepreneurship education. So we we, we read a lot. We read a, over like a near, nearly two hundred uh, submissions, and we look at a lot of lot of the assessments. And most of them, honestly, they, they're not very good. In basically. In, uh, in the other co-editor is Ron Beghetto. He, he's been editing the journal of, uh, uh, of, of be creative behaviors for a long time. So Ron is a professor at Arizona State. So we've been chatting a lot about this. So if you want to solve a problem of the future, you don't know. We need you to come up with a solution. I don't know. So like teachers, we don't know the answers. We don't know the questions. A rubric there would be very bad because you design a rubric still trying to capture what matters, but maybe that creative thing, you know, is something that's completely new. You can't apply the, even the different domains into it. It's like artist, you know, like sometimes you go to a museum and say, well, this is art. Apparently it is, but when somebody treats it as art, so that's the kind of domain areas you may not have to come up with a rubric, but to look at authentic product. I was just you know, thinking about that, that the possibility of expanding our thinking, you know, for our teachers. Well, I actually think rubrics are kind of productive overall, but I got to start somewhere and I have to start with what people do. I can't tell a faculty, throw out your rubrics because it's old school thinking. That's an instant non-starter, Young. So is there a way to take something that is deeply ingrained in everyday business that is probably not going to immediately be thrown out and get it on a ramp toward creativity and originality. Well, that, uh, that's Adam, really the problem. We can agree that rubrics suck. I, I'll take that. But I also have to be practical. Well, I just put into a school name, it's called the Slate School in the US. They have been doing assessment without rubrics. So you guys can check out on, on, on them and how, how they're doing. And so, yeah, yes, you know, traditionally you would think, you know, you gotta have a rubric to do something. But a rubric has another problem. It, uh, you know, we, we aim at a score. 
a score for each student. This is a, a, a Stephen Jay Gould's uh, assessment. Human beings have this strong innate desire to compare people. So when we have something, and we want to compare, we want to sort people. So we have a rubric, then we return a complex thing into a score. So we can, we can, you know, bell curve all the students to say, oh yeah, you know, Nancy is good. And uh, maybe Shano is kind of good. And Anna is not so good. So eventually we, we come at that point, you know, to, to have a score. You know how, I, I have to tell you a story, Anna. So we're doing faculty evaluation. I won't tell you which university. We don't know what to do with all the different professors. So we end up giving everybody a five on their teaching. We had rubrics, we had thinking. So we had to give people five. Yeah. And then people become suspicious. So why do you give everybody five? You know, there has to be a difference. You know, if you were a boss, you get a five of every student. You feel bad, you know, just, God, why do I do this? You know, I, I've been teaching for so many years. It's very hard for me to give students a grade. I hate giving grades. And because people, you know, what are you assessing, you know, in, in essence? So anyway, so I don't like rubrics, I, but, but you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky I'm in a position I don't have to rate myself, but people do rubrics. They do rubrics. Now I'm good with, here, here's my top level thinking on rubrics, that you have a library of every single element that's in any rubric, this massive rubric library. And students are able to go to the library and put in a description of their work that they wanna do, their proposed work, because it's gonna be co-designed, not just teacher designed. And students are gonna select out of the library of rubric elements, the rubric they want to follow, that they themselves establish. They own the rubric. See, I think part of the problem with rubrics that, is that teachers own the rubric. But in the, in the back to the world of work, you have to be self-directed. You don't want a rubric to create dependency. The worst thing I think schools do every day is create dependent people instead of self-actualized people. So what do you think of the idea that there's this rubric library and students will put it together. They own the design of the rubric. Teachers sign off so they know what the rubric is. Give advice to the student if they've left something out. Does that help you build this ramp out? Well, I think uh, that's a much better idea. But still, there would be domains. Like if it's truly creative domains, you wouldn't be able to apply a rubric. And, and, but most of the time, I would say, what is a co-created rubrics or agreed upon with students, that's definitely better, you know? But at the same time, I, mean, I, I, I like that idea a lot. You know, you, it's because co-creating assessment with students, you're helping students to understand how learning needs to be assessed, how learning can move forward, I think that's, I, I'm actually interested in that part of the idea is a lot to say, can we recreate, co-create? You are basically teaching them a mysterious process that students never had any chance to deal with. That's, right. that's beautiful, Alan. I know you're beautiful. You come up with great ideas. So thank you. Rubric library, it wouldn't be hard to build. There's enough content and rubrics to put together a rubric database. It's yeah, that's very interesting. So Nancy, you have, we have any questions? We don't want to dominate the conversation. Remember, this is a conversation, not a presentation. We just can't try to come up with ideas that might stick. What do you think when about you going to my the three survey questions? Sure, go ahead. We do the three survey questions? Okay, so uh, we got to put the, the web address. It's um, www.pollev.com forward slash the learning. So I'm gonna put that in the uh, chat box. Let me just check it, polev.com. There it is. So if people go to the chat box and you grab that um, web address, and Nancy, do me a favor, just check that for me again, that I put the right one in and, um, and that'll be all good. 
and then I have there's three questions that it's, that it's are in perfect, this. Alan. Um, pardon me. It's perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. There there are three questions. Um, let me uh, go to the three questions. So the first one is um, students suggest student success during online learning. Did it increase? Did it stay the same? Is it less? So you got three choices, up, down, the same. I'm really curious on what people think has happened during COVID. Alan? Wow, look at that. It's uh, not much increased. An increase almost balances out. Most of it is the same. Wow, I'm impressed. I'm super impressed. Um, increase is 10%. We got to look at that. And let's, let's look at the edges, Young, right? The increase and the decrease. Um, okay, the next question. Uh, people might have to uh, refresh. Yeah. What are teachers' attitudes about online learning? No change in attitude. Increase. People want more when they go back. People want less when they go back. You don't know. What, what's going on in teachers' minds about online, exploring online learning when they return to in-class? Wow, look at that. Increase. Overwhelming. Oh my gosh. That's fascinating also. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go on to the next one. And this is the last one. Just one word. You might have to refresh again. One word to describe emergency online learning experience. This should show up as a word cloud, I'm lucky. So this time you just type in a word. Wow, invigorating, creativity. Look at this, Young. I can see the results. You have to repeat to me, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, Alan, Alan, share your screen. I can share my screen, exactly. Yeah. Uh, because this, I think, might interest you. Um, let's see if I can do this. Google Chrome. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so again, Young, I just said, you know, what's one word? There, there's an article here, Young. <laughs> yes. So creative and creativity, you add those together. That's, that's a big one. There are a lot of people that found this to be a creative time and, and obviously chaotic and challenging. Um, well, that's stressful. creativity is, right? I mean, you have to have chaos and challenge to bring creativity out. Yeah, say more about that because look at the pattern. That's what it is. So, uh, well, I think, you know, when do we become creative? Actually, when do we learn anything? I've always told people memorization or repeating the same behavior is not learning. You know, that's a, what a dog can do, right? A dog, if a dog knows one place, a dog goes to a place, that's repeat repetition. So what, what makes human beings learn or creative is new chaotic and challenging situations which our schools don't do much. Our schools train our kids as dogs, you know, after a while to say after fourth, fifth grade, what's the learning? If we look at a lot of our schools, the learning is just repeating existing answers to existing problems. I think, uh, uh, you know, COVID has created very chaos, very much chaos. You know, a lot of you teachers have become very creative, you know, all the solutions and have become creative and have also become Hopefully you are not just being, you're not challenged. I mean, you are challenged by the chaos, but you are not suppressed by the chaos. And you have teachers who are suppressed 
who are demotivated by the chaos because, oh my God, you know, I can't do this. But now I think many of you have discovered is the great opportunity to do something different because school is wrong as a norm. School is wants to maintain norms, wants to, you come in at seven o'clock, you go out at 3.30, this is the work you do in school, this is the homework and all those things. But really, if you would invite us to examine, when are our students learning to fail? We are our students learning to be creative we are our students actually dealing with the real meaningful situations or problems. They're not. They are treating this as a job, repeating the whole thing. Yes, you may be teaching something new in certain subjects, but that knowledge may not be as important as they create with that knowledge. Anyway, so that this is this is a great. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm so happy to say this. This is uh, uh, wonderful. You know. I survive better in chaos, you know. Well, if we go back, okay. So let me. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna take us back to the, the, uh, the first two questions. The um, if we look at, you know, some students through all this chaos increased their success. I have story after story of teachers telling me that students who were quiet and who typically did not do well, excelled during COVID. Where other successful students who did extremely well in class, in fact, Chanel was telling me the story of her own sister's children. I don't know, Chanel, if you want to elaborate on that because your voice is shot with COVID, but just let me know. Yeah, no, I don't mind. I, uh, my sister has two children. One is uh, in grade 12 and the other is in university. And her grade 12 child uh, son is very, very bright, very good with math and science, very motivated. But the year, but grade 11, the whole year of COVID, he, he practically, I would say, flunked or just scraped by because he says, I can't learn online. And on the other hand, her daughter, who had to be pushed to study, is excelling online. So it's like, in, in one household, there are two children who have a totally different uh, view and, you know, learning point when it comes to online learning. Yeah. So the, your, that story begs the question, was the 12th grader all of a sudden exposed to online learning and had no prior preparation? So he was conditioned to be dependent on the direction of a teacher in a physical classroom, and he could not uh, manage his own learning online when he didn't, when he wasn't surrounded by that social setting. So we have to ask ourselves: Are we creating dependent learners? I think that's one of the most important questions that should come out of seeing the opposite behaviors and success rates. In fact, we could do a survey, you know, where we carefully look at teacher behavior, how much teacher behavior creates dependent learning. You and know, Alan, it's, uh, it's a lot. I, I love this question because it's so confusing. Okay, so I love this because uh, I think everybody has a definition of what, uh, what success means. And there was one person raising that question, what do you mean by success? So that's why I love this question because everybody was responding based on their own interpretation of success. And, and like you mentioned that, I think Chanel, you mentioned about what do you even mean by learning? You know, for example, if we learned to that, that you know, one thing, I am globally connected. That probably is a very important thing in life for lifelong learners that you are able to learn from, with, others globally, that, that's really important. Or if you become dependent, I mean, become independent, like you were talking about schools teach dependency, but if you become more independent on your own, you're managing your own learning environment, you've become your own owners of learning, that's probably very, very important you know, as well for life. So we might have lost in what we call instruction but we have gained in education. 
you know, what you've learned in your class might have dropped, but, but you've become a better person. You know, life is hard. You know that pandemics can happen. You know, human beings can be isolated, but you still try to connect, try to collaborate. You know, that might have uh, been very important. So that's why I love this question. Thank you, Alan. This, you came up with the best questions. For, for all the confusion. All right, let, let's go on. The, the next one is about teachers. Um, just attitudes. I don't know how you define attitudes, but um, look at this increase, Young. So out of the chaos and out of the stress, uh, at least on this webinar, there's this overwhelming sense that uh, there's this interest in online learning. So I, I have my well, favorite. Go ahead. I wonder if you wanted to share observations you have about you know, your next steps to support this. Amazing, this is amazing to me. Well, you know, when I look at this survey, you know, again, I, I love it. A anything you come up with, Alan, I love it. You know, okay. So, so, so I, I, I look at this, this, uh, uh, this, this, this question. It's uh, um, because we have a different population. You know, who would uh, come up to a webinar with Alan and Yong Zhao at this time? So you guys are amazing people. You, you are the people who've done amazing things with online learning. And if we truly get to a population of entire population of teachers, what would they say about online learning? I I'm actually know. really curious about that, right? You know, because this is a different population. You guys have an all positive view of the world. You are great people and that's why you are here. And we only hang out with great people. And, <laughs> but whoever comes come in will be wonderful. Uh, but but th there's uh, the, the but the majority increase in value for online serve activities. I think it has uh, a lot to do with our students. Because you know, in, in terms of equity, equality, we have a lot of poor kids who can't get online. You know, which, you know we have a lot of places who are doing online learning as online instruction. We have a lot of places doing like online learning as television or radio and access. So I was, if we unpack this question to say, are the online activities driven by teachers or driven by students? Are the online activities content focused or activity focused? You know, are we still replicating schools online or are we redoing different activities, uh, you know, like uh, more project-based learning, you know, I call it product oriented learning and that actually changes a lot. I know many schools try to replicate themselves online. They have like seven o'clock, lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. That didn't work very well, which gives many teachers an opportunity to reinvent. And that, invitation, that invention may have changed a lot. Okay. Um, uh, go ahead. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask both you guys. I'm gonna ask both you guys a question. This came up because of this conversation, which um, is a really important question. We're looking at the students right now. How do you overcome the idea of children not having that social interaction right now? So we see by the poll that majority there's an increase in value of online activities, but on the other side, what about that concept of social interaction for children? You mean only face to face when you say social, or do you mean? Uh, well, the question life? says the question says how do you overcome the deficit of social interaction? Our students are online since March of last year, and still no light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm I'm thinking it more in terms of just children playing with one another, the concept of play, the concept of just going on a field and you know kicking a ball and just enjoying each other's company. Um, that's how I'm understanding this question. Well, I'm all for that. I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I don't know well, if there is an answer. How do you overcome the deficit of social interaction? I mean, well, social, oh, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you a story about social interaction. 
which may be counter to everything you're thinking. And, but I have this um, friend whose Twitter handle is uh, the live bit. T H E L I V B I T, the live bit. When she got on Twitter, she was uh, nine years old. And she got on Twitter because she was bullied at school. She loves reading. And she lives in rural New Hampshire. And um, her classmates didn't value books like she did. So it was dangerous. She, she, was, she was physically bullied, didn't want to go back to school. So her mother, who is really quite gifted at social emotional learning, gets her a Twitter account so she can share her ideas about her love of books with people all over the world. I'm gonna guess her Twitter account today, I can go look at this, but the last time I looked it was 40,000 plus. <gasps> now she's 12, I'm just gonna tell you she's 11 or 12 years old today. She's written a book, she's been invited all over the world. Uh, one day mm -hmm. I called her, cause I, I wrote the preface to her book and it was quite an honor and uh, so I called her to check with things and she answered her cell phone during a school day. She should have been not answering the phone. And I said, where are you? You're supposed to be in school. She says, I'm in Ohio. She lives in New Hampshire. I said, what are you doing in Ohio? She said, oh, I found out on Twitter that this school here where I am, I've been invited, lost its music program with budget cuts. And it was based on ukuleles. So I found out, I put out on Twitter, a request for people to send unused ukuleles to this oh. elementary school in Ohio. They quickly got past all the ukuleles they used to have, 30. 30 ukuleles came in right away. So they invited her to cut the ribbon to reinstore oh. the music program. This little girl, I think she was 11, 10, 11 at the time. Mm. And so do you call that social interaction? Mm, exactly. Right? It's a combination, Nancy, yeah. of a little girl with empathy, right? I would call that social skill, having empathy for a group of kids she's never physically laid eyes on, was mad that they lost their music program. She has a global network socially, she says, send in the ukuleles. Then she goes to Ohio. So I, I don't, so it's not one or the other for me. It's this uh, blended jump on, jump off, jump on, jump off. It's just not one or the other. I would agree. I, I think um, it's another thing. I, I, I don't know what this, you know, the person who asked the question, what it means. Yeah, I don't. I, I'm a person who always said, you do the best, whatever you can, you know, but I, I have to say online social networking has become very important. Even before COVID-19, the Pew Charitable, I'm sure Alan, you know, this survey, kids spend more time on social media, I mean, on, online anyway, they might be watching TikTok or YouTube, but they're chatting, they're, you know, the kids invent their ways. Remember before COVID, with how many times parents are worried the kid are worried kids don't never get out. They play games at home and they're chatting with the friends. That they, they they're not outside. You know we had that concern. I think another thing I just want to throw out here is that kids are different. We have diverse kids. Kids are different. We got hundreds of millions of kids who are actually different, and. They will find ways. We, we've seen young kids, like three-year-olds, pick up the phone, calling their grandparents, calling. You know, if that's social, that's learning. You know, we, we've seen kids in, when they travel our, uh, different places, they keep track with each other. So we have a lot more social tools for doing that. I'm not denying the importance of kids hanging out in the yard, if possible. If not, you know, actually, can we imagine if COVID really stopped human beings from hanging out, we will still live. You know, I know it's social and, and, and we will reinvent social interactions, you know, you, or, or, you know, we will find ways to redo something. So 
Again, it's important to have social interactions in person. It's important hanging out, playing games. I am not denying that, but if human beings were not allowed to do that, what would we do? So that, that I'm always taking the hardest transfer. Well, if that's the case, we invent. I can tell you guys, I'm getting my vaccination today, my first shot, the Pfizer uh, at 12 o'clock. Uh, I didn't do it. My, my action, I didn't care. I came back um, March 4th from S Spain last year. They have never left my house. And I've been very happy. Every day I'm socializing with guys like you. I'm hanging out, I'm doing webinar. I really have not got out. My son was so worried I might die. So he went on, he signed up for me and he got, even got my birthday around. So I don't know if that's gonna affect my vaccination. But anyway, so, so I have been, I actually enjoy this very much. I work for two universities, but I'm just in one place. I mean, I'm not in either place. So it's really interesting. I've had more social meetings with my department and because I cannot participate in every department meeting. Anyway, so that's just, I'm not denying the importance. I'm just saying, do the best you can. Well, let's take a, you know, I used to be a social studies teacher. And I'm gonna tell you as a social studies teacher, I had a textbook. That was it. That was the main source of information. All, all the kids had the same textbook. It's supposed to read the same chapter at the same time. But I met a teacher, a social studies teacher in Norway, who for every topic used his global networks to engage kids. They used Skype to have conversations with people who were connected to the curriculum, like uh, grandmothers in Russia who lived through the Cold War, a teenage uh, prisoner in the United States, a policeman in Chicago. This is from Norway. South African apartheid. They, they all had to, all the students had to think on their feet, you know, and engage and ask questions. So I'd like to think that kids will meet kids their own age in school and they'll play with some of those kids, other kids they won't even like. But the responsibility of school moving forward, I think, is to introduce kids to develop social skills to people they would never otherwise meet on their own. My sense is schools should expand boundaries for kids, not the same boundaries. I mean, we can do well in the same boundaries, that's okay. But real responsibility of school is to expand boundaries. So right away, there are certain departments, languages, social studies, where I would put an extra emphasis on how do you introduce children to real time social interactions online. They need that for the global economy. Can you imagine being a social studies teacher, calling yourself a social studies teacher and not connecting your kids to the world during the time of the web? It blows my mind. I'm old enough well, I can say that now. Well, Alan, that's uh, probably Donald Trump's social studies is not, you know, we build a wall that that's different uh, social studies, you know, think about it. That that. I think about Donald Trump, Donald Trump's social studies building wall, walls, you know, to kind of uh, make sure we are uh, confined from others. I was just joking with you about Donald Trump, you know, I'm sure, you know, but anyway, the, 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 the piece, you know, I, I was uh, reading the chat. It's kind of fascinating. And we, we, I was emphasizing individual diversities. I was also in, uh, suggesting what used to be norm may not be norm. I, I, I was uh, actually thinking about this. One time I was in an airport, I think Washington DC. So I saw a blind person who has to navigate through the airport. So it just got me to think, because we built to serve the people with eyes who can see. Therefore, we disadvantage others who can't see. So if we imagine if the airport were built to serve people who cannot see, what would the airport be like? So this is what I was talking about, you know, when COVID is here, uh, we could try to connect with others and we want to, but we have these conditions. Uh, I don't know, actually, it's going to be interesting. 
for example, China has returned to normal. Australia has very few cases mm -hmm. and New Zealand has. And so kids around the globe did actually have slightly different uh, scheduling. I mean, London has been horrible. If you look, look at all this in the US, how would these kids come out to be different? Or would there be any difference? Imagination, okay. So today is what we call conversations with Alan with you guys. I was just wanting to ask to imagine all these new possibilities. What are the, in how are they different? I, I saw someone from Mexico talking about kids watching TV. And uh, how is that affecting? You know, if they don't have the internet, what, what happens? Don't get me wrong. I know kids who got really excited when they can go back to school. You know, with kids really, you wouldn't believe how excited they, they were. And I don't know how long that would last, honestly. They, they want to go back to say their friends and teachers. And yet, if you teach in lower grades, you may get more excitement than teaching higher grades. I'm fascinated by your observation of the blind person in the airport. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to I'm going to connect that if I may. Um, yes. I'm a big believer in kids solving real problems in the community. It's how I got started with technology. I had this course called Community Problem Solving Technology. So a friend of mine in uh, Istanbul at a great international school found out that the Turkish government had uh, taken geometry out of the curriculum for blind children. Somebody decided that blind children could not learn geometry. And this is a geometry teacher. So she was mad. And uh, she asked her students on a Saturday to go down to the center for families who have blind children and design the entire geometry curriculum for blind children by working with individual families and their children apart across the curriculum. So different kids would have different sections. And they did it young. They, after months and months of work, they created an entire curriculum, hands-on. Because if you have to ask a blind ch child, um, how many sides does a cube have? They, there's no way to know. They did it. You know, Anna, th that's beautiful. Go ahead, C Those carry on. Geometry, they learn geometry. Not only that, then they started getting in touch with centers of the blind. We have one in Boston, there's one in London, there's one in Philadelphia. They started to send out their curriculum for testing around the world to get feedback from professionals after they developed it with improvement. So now they're engaged in dealing with professionals. To me, that all makes sense at a time of COVID that you, you want to send kids out into the community, solve real problems, and then work with people globally. I, I love what you said. So I have one, one proposal, which I think I said <laughs> many, many years before. Like I blame illiteracy not on kids not able to read. It's on, on the guys who made reading popular. So, so that, you know, if we never created the machine to print, we never had an illiteracy problem. 500 years ago, who cared? You know, if you didn't read, that, that never mattered. In my village, never really truly mattered. You know, when I was growing up, nobody read, you know, who cares? So, so I'm actually use, using that to think about technology today. I don't say this very often because people always criticize me. They say, oh, you don't think reading is important? Yeah, it is, but really? But really today, do you have to read? Because people say, oh, we, if you don't read, you lose so much. Yes, indeed. But look at our children's consumption. A lot of them are audio, video based. And in another 30 years, you'll be listening, you'll be watching, you're podcasting. You, you. Yes, we, we, we'd have you know, great literature written, but writing is really a horrible way of doing things. We did not have better technology. If like 2000 years ago, we had to this technology, would you invent a stupid writing system with 26 letters, you know, however many letters to write? 
it's a very boring system, would you think? And, but I rely on reading, actually, I, because I'm old. And my children do not. I don't watch a lot of TikTok. But I have been conditioned to do that. Remember the invention of writing is simply trying to pass on information across time and distance. But if we had, you know, today's YouTube recording, would we still have to do that? Again, a question for us to think about. And people have said, oh, Jung Zhao says he's against reading. I said, I'm not against reading. I'm just thinking about the time, the idea for us to rethink in new technological environments. Oh, I'm with you. I think we should teach TikTok literacy. TikTok is the most addicting thing I've ever done. I'm not going to uh -huh. tell you what I do on it is absolutely, I have to force myself to get off TikTok. And, but what's interesting to me about the difference between reading or paper technology and digital technology is the book does not read the reader. TikTok reads the viewer. TikTok knows exactly what you watch, what you skip over, how many, time, how many seconds you're on one screen. It's amazing the algorithm behind TikTok. That's why it's so addicting. It's feeding you exactly what you want. And it's growing every day. That's dangerous. We don't teach kids algorithms. If you want to be literate, my sense is, I don't care what the media is, but you have to understand the algorithm of that media whether it's a search engine, what's the algorithm of Google? You know, type into Google, are cats better than dogs? Everybody on this web should do this right now. Are cats better than dogs? You will see that cats are only better than dogs. There's no room for dogs being better because the algorithm of Google gives you what you want to hear, not balance. So I love that you picked up literacy but it isn't, the it isn't whether you're reading or watching, it's understanding the algorithm, which our kids do not, because we don't teach algorithms. And that is the most dangerous thing we don't teach is understanding algorithms. Well, uh, I, I just add one more thing, then we'll go. So I don't believe there's any one particular knowledge that we should impose on all children. So my, 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 my basic, uh, um, I just wrote a book about this called Learners Without Borders. You can buy that and you know, I'm promoting my book. That will come out probably in uh, August. It's called Learners Without Borders. I think our kids have been confined by borders and border, curriculum borders, school border, teacher border, classroom border, pathway border, examination border. We have so many borders for kids, right? I mean, just imagine that. So, so what, one of the things I proposed, I said, well, there may be about 30% of the time of kids should be spent on common things. 30%, society, social organization, maybe Allen's algorithm, maybe literacy, you can decide in all those things. But a majority of this students, there's so much knowledge, so much out there. Every kid should have a jagged profile where they can thrive as unique individuals. So I just want to emphasize that's a really strong point there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's how things happen that you come to believe something that's absolutely false. Plenty of that in the United States. And you trace back, why do people believe this is false? And typically it's because of digital content they haven't been reading, or maybe they have, it doesn't matter. And my sense is they don't know how they've been manipulated. Anyway, Nancy, is there, do we have questions that we should respond well, to? Are, well, they're just doing wonderful comments. One is about, let's change the curriculum. You know, obviously that's a big uh, question when you look at, are we, do we really need to be teaching everything that we're teaching? You know, the idea, I think Young mentioned the idea of being entrepreneurs. How do we support that concept with students right now? So they're not just doing the typical chapter by chapter online, replicating but actually really fostering that ability of being entrepreneurs and just going for their passion. So that's been more of statements in the chat, which I find totally you know, exciting to hear the idea of 
get rid of the, not get rid of, but rewrite it and having the kids be in the driving, uh, driving seat when it comes to making them the entrepreneurs of the future. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce a concept I've been thinking about for a while called the first five days. It's the first five days of school. So given COVID and all of that, uh, you know, we'll finish up the year. And then my sense is, how do we start the next school year? This coming in this country, September, uh, what do you do? Because once the year starts, you're on a roll. So my sense is, what do you do at the beginning of the year to create the culture that connects kids to the world and empowers them, learners without borders, mm -hmm. uh, that establish skill-based and relationship-based experiences. We'll leave content for a while, five days. Don't focus on content. Focus on the skills that all year could improve what we do. And I would, you know, I have my own five days, but you know, day one, I'll introduce it. Day one, teacher shows a, a photograph, a painting, 10 seconds of a video, some stimulus without telling kids what it is. And kids just have to ask as many questions as they can. First day, the focus is all about kids asking questions. And then how do you take the open ones and make them closed? How do you take the closed ones and make them open? That on day one, you teach kids the structure of asking questions. I think that's an unusual way to start a school year. Mm. I wonder what Young thinks about entrepreneurship. That would be... Well, we don't have time. So I think I would just... <laughs> one, uh, one big message I have is make sure you always let students drive their learning. We support them. Mm -hmm. True. Love. Can I give a plug for my book? Please. Uh, <laughs> learning. <laughs> I'm convinced we, we have to have kids owning. I mean, there's a balance. I don't know what the exact balance is, but I think traditionally we're out of balance. And, uh, and the Who Owns the Learning book covers all kinds of strategies to help shift that, that balance towards the learner. Thank you. I think it's time up. I, we could go on and on. I, I just have to say thank you, Young and Alan. Great, great conversation. And, and thank you, Nancy. It was just brilliant. And I just have to thank everybody who's here. What wonderful questions, what wonderful comments uh, in the chat. So thank you all. Um, and uh, I hope there has been a lot of learning and there's been a lot of discussion here. So uh if there are any questions and i know somebody alan has asked where can they get to get to read about the first five days so we will uh we will we'll send you out yeah. yeah i have an article on that yeah. well we we'll, we'll put out that article for everybody um so a little bit of pitching from my side next week we have another complimentary webinar with kath Murdoch, ron richard and mark church so i look forward to your uh, participation there Again, thank you, Alan and Young. Wonderful, wonderful hour. I didn't even know where.